I am Tom R. and welcome to Village Connect. I'm glad you're with us. We want to look at two passages in this uh, section. First, read together Mark 14, 32 through 42. And then turn the page and read chapter 15, 33 through 39. Both of these passages come from what's called the Passion Narrative in Mark. That's the, the story of Jesus' death. And so read from chapter 14 and chapter 15, and when you have concluded that, uh, come back and we'll begin the study. So in the first reading, we find Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. That beautiful garden is the place that Jesus went for retreat. He took his disciples with him. And most of the passage is about the disciples and their inability to stay awake while Jesus prayed. But what I want to invite you to talk about in your time together is the prayer that Jesus offers. I don't know if prayer is something you feel particularly comfortable with, particularly skilled at, the thing to notice about this prayer is not its eloquence or, or poetry, it's honest. Prayer is always good if it's honest. And what Jesus says is, I want this cup, I want this crucifixion, I want this death to be removed from me. To say it more plainly, what Jesus says is, God, I don't want what you want. Your will and my will are not aligned. What you want for me and my life is not what I want. That is a universal human experience. It is often that we don't want what God wants for us. Just think of the things that Jesus taught. And we know our own struggle to align our lives with the will of God. It's a universal human experience to not want what God wants. And we see in this prayer Jesus' humanity. But then he says, but not what I want, but what you want. And, and some would say that in that moment we see the divinity of Jesus, that his will aligns with God. But I think once again we see the humanity of Jesus. He is actually showing us what it is to be human. If we're human, we're not always going to want what God wants for us. But to be fully human, we respond to what God wants for us and for all. Because God wants that which is good for us. This, this cup is an expression of God's own love for the world that, uh, for the world that God so loves. And so... So what we see in this moment is the full humanity of Jesus to even in those moments where we don't want what God wants, to still, still seek to be responsible, accountable, obedient to the will of God, trusting that God knows for our good sometimes better than we know ourselves. So now in this second passage, the second reading, it's the death of Jesus. And there are several things to lift up in this, uh, just, just to know. The, uh, the first is, he, he cries out, and they think he's crying for Elijah. It's a reference to an old prophetic promise that before God's ultimate work of redemption was to come, Elijah, the prophet Elijah, would return. If you read the Gospels carefully, it's clear all of the Gospel writers interpreted John the Baptist to fulfill that function, that indeed what was expected had occurred. But then Jesus breathes his last, and two things happen that are remarkable. 
First of all, Mark swings the camera, if you will, away from uh, the crucifixion to the temple, and it says the curtain in the temple was torn from top to bottom. Uh, the curtain referenced there is the curtain that hung before the Holy of Holies. On the other side of the curtain was the Ark of the Covenant. It was understood to be the home of God, the home address where God dwelled. What it Mark says is in the, cur in the death of Jesus, that curtain is torn. There is no barrier there anymore. Mark uses that verb to be torn apart one other place in the gospel, and that's at the baptism of Jesus. At the baptism of Jesus, it says, as he came up out of the waters, the heavens were torn apart. In other words, in the life and death of Jesus, there is no longer any barrier between you and God. Any barrier of sin or failure or brokenness, it's all removed. There is no barrier between us and God. Now the next thing to notice in this passage is that it says Jesus breathed his last and the centurion the centurion standing watch, he says, truly this was God's son. Now if you, if you read through the entire gospel, what's interesting to note is this is the first person who calls Jesus the son of God. We are told in the very first verse that that's who Jesus is. Mark says it's the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the son of God. And we're told at his baptism, there's a voice from heaven who says, this is my son. We're told at his transfiguration, a voice from heaven says, this is my son. But no one understands that. When Jesus asks his disciples, who do people say that I am? Who do you say that I am? Peter says, you are the Christ. That's correct, but it's incomplete. It is only at the cross that anyone is able to confess that Jesus is the Son of God. Now, if you were to read that historically, that it's a biography, it's, it's quite problematic. Why in the world would the centurion see that and nobody else? But it's not a historical statement, it's a theological statement. What Mark knows is that it's only when you stood at the foot of the cross that you can see most clearly the Spirit of God in Jesus. It's not in his miracles. It's not in his teaching. It is in this unending display of love that the Spirit of God is witnessed in Jesus. And so the centurion speaks for you, the reader of this gospel, to say this is the moment where you see the Spirit of God most clearly in the life of Jesus. Now I think as we reflect on this in our own life, one of the things to recognize is that if the Spirit of God is seen in the midst of Jesus' loving acts of sacrificial love and suffering, then suffering and sacrifice in our lives is not a sign that God is somehow absent but it is perhaps in those moments of sacrificial love and suffering that we are able to see the presence of God in our lives most clearly.